Okay, so we actually talked about this and decided that we're gonna have like a little bit of a new um, segment in the podcast. Wait, I did not introduce that no, we actually started it. No, you didn't say it. hi, nothing. Just like, Hello. was busy on her phone. <laughs> typical. <laughs> Hello. What do you mean typical? <laughs> There's 20 episodes to show the opposite. Don't even start with this. Because <laughs> I know the real you. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is rude. Um, yeah. Well, in any case, welcome you know what back. this is. Yeah, welcome back. Um, <laughs> we're we're here with Alyssa today, and we're gonna be talking wow. about surrealism. But it, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a new segment. Okay, so the the new segment is kind of like rapid fire questions for the guest because we want to make it. Um, I don't know a little bit. Well, more I also want to get to know Alyssa because I do not know you. Yes. Okay, I was not re- prepared for rapid fire, so it's it's really fun questions like, and like <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah, okay, but we'll yeah. do they're really easy. They're best. really easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do we should we start with like the ones that are like this or that, or should we? Yeah, let's do this or that sure. and then move on to the. Okay. More like it'll be a little warm up. Yeah. This okay, is so this is good because it's like rapid fire releases the subconscious. Yeah. And then exactly. Gets us for real. Exactly. Uh-huh. This is yeah. automatism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um a few questions that are kinda like choose one, right? Out of two. Okay. So introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. Gold or silver? Gold. Okay. Minimalist or hoarder? Mm. <laughs> Minimalist. <laughs> TV shows or movies? Movies. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Traditional or digital art? Traditional. Okay. So, also about the about the hoarder and minimalist thing. When I saw that um, question, I was like, technically, I think I don't like having a lot of things, but I don't like um, the minimalist aesthetic. Yeah. I don't yeah, know what it looks I, like it looks ugly as hell. It's like it's like dull. Well, and everything is white. Minimalism can be what you want it to be, really, instead of like what they're showing you, where you only have the essential. That's, like for me, it's more like uh, not having things I don't use. That's mm-hmm. exactly why I chose minimalist at the mm-hmm. end. Mm-hmm. But I do like variety and I do like options at the mm-hmm. same time. So. Mm-hmm. The minimalist aesthetic is not exactly, but that's why I chose it at the end too, because it's 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 a mentality. It's exactly. Like, you no, know, I think that I would yeah. probably like it more if it wasn't um, so prevalent nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no like interesting uh, interior design um, in like regular homes nowadays because they're all like you know square and mm-hmm. I don't know white walls and windows, yeah. large windows. Yeah, it's just not nice. Um, anyway, so um, the next question is a little bit more in depth, which is, what is your dream project? <gasps> dream project. Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, well, I'm currently working in the design field, and uh, I'm also a visual artist, so I have been thinking a lot recently about um, how to balance both worlds of art and design. Uh, recently I've been thinking a lot about I enjoy teaching mm-hmm. and one day in my life I would love to uh, just have an art studio just like a, a private business where um, I'm teaching art to kids young kids and and up to kind of teens that age mm-hmm. so let's say far in the future that would be the dream project that's really nice. yeah. yeah and also I just realized that we did not play the jingle for the section. Oh my gosh, we like made it yesterday. We're so excited about it. (laughs) I literally made it like at night because we just came up with this thing. What is going on? I swear to God, I can't like find a spot for myself. It's like the sun is just right in my eyeball. Anyway, play the (laughs) the thing. We'll just let Lisa struggle for a bit. (laughs) What are you, what are you, what are you supposed to be exactly? Supposed to be exactly. Duh, duh. I'm a goth supermodel from the future. Duh, I'm a goth supermodel. Goth, 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 
in the future. There you go. A nice supermodel from, from the future. The future. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's a nice project to, you know. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, what posters did you have up in your room as a kid, if you had any? Or as a teen, I don't think you know, I had any posters, but that's not a good enough answer. I don't, I don't. <laughs> I think I had enough. I don't think I had any posters growing up, um, and I mean we we lived in a very religious environment, so pop culture was not a common theme in my childhood. But what I can say is we had some little like art pieces up on the wall, and I remember a couple postcards that were would be in the living room or the kitchen, and one that always stuck with me was an image by the artist August Maka. And it's called the Turkish Cafe. It has it has a nice a nice mix of blue and orange and yellow, just kind of every color in it. And um, that that painting always uh, always reminded me of like the picture on the wall. And it was just this big. It was a little postcard. Mm -hmm. I, I was just gonna ask about the um, uh, the religious. Um, like pop culture relationship did you have the same yeah. thing of like harry potter being like the worst thing imaginable like everyone was like, always yeah. like don't you dare read harry potter and yeah. yeah and i was I mean, like a fan of it well of course right because it's an amazing like yeah undeniably a good story mm -hmm. um for kids but uh yeah i mean in my surroundings most most of what was said, and it depends who you talk to as well. It depends mm -hmm. who you talk to, even within our family. My dad and my mom had different opinions on this, but um, within the church environment, I remember summer camps where that would come up, and a lot of the time it was it was like oh, magic powers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not See, like sometimes I think about it, and I think there's like no way that people were so mad about this, like imaginary concept of magic in the past that they like yeah. burn people and now i think but like no fear honestly yeah it. considering yeah. that even nowadays religious even folk nowadays. have this like yeah attitude it's like okay i can believe that mm -hmm. i can believe but that it's people such a, it's such a different mentality that it's hard to wrap your hand or, head around oh, yeah sure. no it's weird. <laughs> and I remember, weird i remember i had like this whole fight with one of my like my literature teacher because i went to a religious school right and at home Honestly, it was quite secular. Like, mm -hmm. my parents were never even in church, like, ever. <laughs> I don't know why I went to a religious school, to be honest. I was, like, not supposed to be there. To... <laughs> but um, it's weird because, like, yeah, at home, like, everyone read Harry Potter. And it was, like, one of our, like, favorite things to watch as a family and whatever. But then at school, whenever I would bring it up, it was, like, a whole thing. Like, they would just lose their shit. And it's, like, yeah. such a weird thing to lose your shit over. <laughs> it really is. Um, another question is, last film you watched? The last... Oh, Napoleon Dynamite. Last night with my brother and his girlfriend, we watched mm -hmm. How was Napoleon it? Dynamite while eating dinner. It's a crazy movie. I've never mm. seen it in full from start to finish. And uh, yeah, it's just, have, have both of you seen it? No, no I've heard about it, but I want to I okay. watch it, yeah. I mean, watch it. I can understand how it's the typical movie to watch while you're high, because it's just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, but funny, funny and goofy, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And There's a really good question. dance sequence in it. Oh, oh. okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's up our alley. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, okay, so the last question, which we're going to be asking everyone since it's like my shtick that I started the podcast with, which is like um, nostalgic childhood TV shows and stuff like that. Yeah. And like mixing it with art and everything and camp. <laughs> so um, the question is your favorite childhood TV show? Um... There's one that was, I'm going to forget the name, but it was with these magical dragons. Um, Dragon Tales? Dragon Let's Tales? Let's say Dragon Tales. Yeah, it's Dragon Tales. Wait, let me <laughs> see. Go with that one. I want to see what it looks like. Maybe I know. Yeah, you have oh. to look at it. 
They're just oh, like very don't. cute and colorful dragons. Yeah, that was a good show. <laughs> That's cute. Oh, yeah. I know that one. It had like talking flowers in it and things like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I watched it in French, so I can't even remember the name of it in French, no. but that was so fun. I think they have it in Spanish, too. Whoa, this is taking me back like crazy. <laughs> yeah. <I> completely <laughs> forgot. <laughs> this is good for our topic. That's awesome. Potty flowers. So Very funny. surrealist. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, let's start our discussion about art. Play the jingle. Art? Mm-hmm. Let's go. Yeah, she's a full-on Monet. It's like a painting, see? From far away, it's okay, but up close, it's a big, big old mess. mess. It's a big old mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, surrealism. There's a lot to talk about with this specific thing. I think that one of the things yeah. that people um, usually <clears throat> confuse surrealism with and stuff like that is um, the difference between when you talk about surrealism as a um, like 19th century oh, oh sorry 20th century um, movement in modern art and uh, comparing it you know to like a bunch of random paintings and random works that are kind of psychedelic in nature that people call surrealist nowadays which is like it's not like it would be inaccurate in terms of like comparing the two because it is you know similar but it's just not technically a surrealist work if you weren't making it at the time you know with the surrealists and other things like that and especially if you don't use their um, techniques right but um, there's a lot of weird shit that they've done <laughs> yeah and um, I told you guys to look at like different types of uh, surrealist art and like whichever speaks to you and whichever you want to chat about yeah. um, so let's start with those like the things that interest you interested you the most um surrealism is so fun to talk about i think especially today because in recent years i feel like the history of surrealism has re had a resurgence especially pointing towards surrealism internationally, not just European, um, and especially female artists. Mm -hmm. And so today, and there's a lot more information about um, about female surrealist artists, which is which is really interesting. And um, the movement started in the 1920s, and you can hear about André Breton, the poet yep. who talks about it, and no, no, no. So it's it's this group of men who start the movement, and then you start to see it spread throughout the 30s, and that's when it spreads internationally and goes to different places like Mexico or just um, where you're gonna find Frida Kahlo, of course. Yeah. And then, even though uh, she was like, no, I don't consider myself as like being a surrealist, even though she really liked it. And when you see her mm -hmm. work, for me, it would be, mm -hmm. but yeah. I understand why she doesn't want to be in the same group with them. For sure. I would also be and like, no, nothing to do with this guy. I know. That's such a, but she had so much more of a complex, I mean, to me, version of surrealism compared because oh, yeah. she was exploring identity, like the, you know, the Mexican identity at that time, which was a huge question through the lens of uh, being a woman as well. So For it's sure. like so much more complex than just the man kind of representing their own subconscious, which ended up being a lot of just sexualizing sex. women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so, Violence and, and that, sex, it just was, that's what it was. Yeah. Honestly. So yeah. embarrassing, can you imagine? Being like, uh, let's talk about my deepest, darkest thoughts. <laughs> and all of them were just like, violence against women and sex, sexual violence oh, against women. It's like, like, okay. Isn't it so interesting that this comes up in my paintings? Like, is it? It kind of scares me. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, the, that's yeah. exactly what I was talking about in like, um, the episode on um, super flat art. How, oh, like, yeah. how incredibly violent it is towards young women. It's insane. Yeah. And like, all the people who are like always talking about it, like oh it's just like so crazy how it just happens like when it tap into my core and it's like okay your core is rotten just saying <laughs> like <laughs> this is not a universal experience or at least it shouldn't be <laughs> 
Yeah, no. Okay, so there are two artists um, that I'm drawn to in Surrealism, and they're Leonora Carrington and Remedios Varro, who I'm pretty sure were friends uh, throughout the movement at some point, too, because um, Leonora Carrington is... I've only seen her, like, a couple of her works. I haven't um, heard of her, like, life story and such. Okay, so she, just in short, she is British, um, born of a wealthy family, very traditional. So as a woman, she becomes a debutante. They want her to, like, you know, all she's meant to do is find a suitable man and, ma you know, maintain tradition within within the family. And, and she, even as a young girl, never fit in in school. She was... She wasn't good at schoolwork. They said that she was never good at collaborating. So essentially, she wasn't obedient. She wasn't, you know, the nice kind of girl that that we were expected to be at that time. At one point in her life, she breaks away from her family and moves to Paris. And that's where, and this is in the 1920s, that's where the Surrealist movement is really happening mm -hmm. and really exciting for people. She meets this man, Max Ernst, who's like a 40-year-old whoever, and they get together. And so she's loving it here because she can you know, really break free from the traditional life that was, you know, very captive for her before. Um, and I'm trying to remember, but I, I'm pretty sure at this point, basically the war breaks out. Max Ernst is, is like taken to a concentration camp, something like this in Germany. And so she's left alone and she ends up having um, a mental breakdown. She has several mental breakdowns just because so much is happening around her at this time. So she gets taken to a hospital. Terrible things happen to her in that hospital. Um, she's she's just like drugged a lot. There's sexual abuse. Wait, why um, was she? Um, like what she kind was of? Yeah, she was originally taken to the hospital because she had a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. So she was taken to a mental institution. Um, but within that hospital, like, just so much shit happens to her that causes so much more pain, obviously. And mm -hmm. so eventually she leaves the hospital. And, and again, I'm not sure exactly why, but she ends up in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I'm pretty sure it's because she couldn't go back home. She didn't want to stay where she was. But somehow she ends up in Mexico and she becomes an artist. And she becomes one of the most famous artists in Mexico at that time, which is so random for yeah. a British woman. But there's an interview with her cousin at one point, some random cousin of hers who's talking to people, and and uh, she ends up at the cousin ends up at dinner with a Mexican woman beside her, and so she says, "Oh, I think I have a cousin over there, Leonora Carrington. Would you know her?" And the Mexican woman beside her's like, "That's the most famous artist in, in Mexico right now. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Do what I do know you mean? her?" <laughs> and I this time I. I'm pretty sure she, here, let me double check, but she meets Remedios Varro at this time too, who's also an incredible, incredible surrealist artist, and they become friends. And, and I mean, being a woman at this time, the war is going on and just everything in general, they're going through a lot. And the exploration of their subconscious at this time, I think, is especially interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Remedios Vero, at one point, she identifies as a witch. Uh, I've read that in several places, so I think it's right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also that aspect of, of I think, just female friendships and, and you know, that magical side that, that can come out. and. Uh, and I love to see that side. So both of their paintings, I find, are actually quite similar. There's a lot of realism in them um, within, you know, but then these just fantastical creatures and kind of like witchy vibes to it and um, and obviously strange things because it is the surrealist. Um, so those two artists I find really interesting. Remedios Varro is an incredible artist as well because she... A couple of things that I can remember off the top of my head. Her father was an architect or engineer something. So she grew up doing engineer drawings. So if you look at her paintings, they're incredibly detailed. And there's a lot of architectural elements in it. And her perspective is amazing. So the amount of talent that she has um, mixed in, combined with like the, the complexity of the themes that she explores, I just always found really mesmerizing yeah I think that it's always interesting to 
look into surrealists that were not um, the first few guys that kind of got into it in Paris, because I think that whenever people think of surrealism, they think of, um, my God, what's his name? Dali? Dali, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the person everybody thinks about, and I feel like most of the time people don't um, know anybody else, even Breton and stuff like that, like they just know True. Dali, right? <laughs> and I think it's interesting that he was the one who kind of got that much attention from the public and especially because he popularized this idea that surrealism is mostly paintings, which in reality was not. It was very much mm -hmm. very, like there was a lot of photography involved in it mm -hmm. and a lot of, um, um, specifically it actually pushed photography a lot further than it was before because uh, before surrealists, I think that photography was just kind of all representational because it was like the new thing that could represent reality hence you know why the painting needed to change because we didn't need paintings to represent reality anymore um but they were the first ones who manipulated uh images either in post or like just cutting up and like creating new images um or you know they, they kind of led into data afterwards but i think that a lot of them pushed photography further with the use of mirrors and other things like that creating images that are real but they look kind of crazy you know because of how they were manipulated or how the picture was taken and i think that it's also sculpture was also involved in it you know and it's interesting that we don't actually hear or see a lot of sculpture um when it comes to surrealism in general that's a good point and i think i like that you're mentioning that there's so many different types of art within it because mm -hmm. for me I look, I look mostly at the paintings when I think of surrealism too, but at the end of the day, there were so many, there's so many different types of art that have stemmed from surrealism, like the photo collage, like you said, like the found object in sculpture um, and other methods, just because people are messing around and doing the weirdest things and then other people catch on and they're like, oh, this can, this can actually be a style or a theme or, you know, a method that we use again and again. Yeah, like grossness. And um, <laughs> um, Uncanny Valley became very popular at the time. Um, there's this artist who, she created a, a wait, actually, wait, the yeah. furry cup. I typically remember the essence oh, yeah, of the yeah. like with the fur. <laughs> the furry cup, yeah. yeah. I just, sometimes I just only remember, oh, you yeah. know. It's so, yeah, I really love that, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. from uh, Merit Oppenheim. I think she like she had a discussion with an artist and he was I don't remember what he said else. to her about yeah. like making this cup and she like literally took it and then created the the it cup. It was that. They were talking about something and uh, and some Picasso about, and her and yes. Dora Mar. Yeah, and Dora Mar was dating Picasso at the time. He like fucked her up yeah. really, really bad. Uh -huh. Um yeah. and they were like talking about basically just about the fact that fur can be put on anything and some objects um that it would cause different sensations if you put it on different objects yeah like if you put fur on on top of a spoon it would make you feel uncomfortable because you associate spoons with mouth right so like things right. kind of things like that about your automatic associ associations i guess um and it was one of those like really popular works that kind of brought up in every single art history class. Mm -hmm. Whenever you talk about surrealism, there's always this um, furry cup that comes up, right? Um, That's true. Yeah. And also, like, when you think about it, it was based on literature because it was brought up by André Breton. And mm -hmm. a fun story that I read is like, so he got inspired by Freud, um, Freud, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, work and then he tried to like get his attention and just kept on failing which ended up on like him showing up at Freud's door and being completely ignored and just like writing an, an article about it calling him like a yeah. an old I don't remember what he said yeah he was like yeah. idealizing old him. man without elegance yes. yes oh my god yeah 
And Freud himself admitted he was like, well, I'm not an artist, so maybe I'm just totally out of it here, out of my depth here, yeah. which was clear. <laughs> but, yeah, I just thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, because yeah. they like they really um, idealized him so yeah. much in the beginning of like surrealism. The entirety of surrealism was literally based on mm -hmm. um, Freud's ideas. Yeah. And, and Freud is like yeah. very like conservative about art yeah. and everything. Yeah. yeah, so it's really funny because they like hated each other, mm -hmm. even yeah. though they were like kind of had like a symbiotic the relationship. Yeah. yeah, of his theories. Yeah. It's his theories put into application mm -hmm. in the art world. So to talk more about this artist that you brought up, um, Remedios Varo? <gasps> Remedios Varo, I'm in love with her work. And there's a lot, there are a lot of themes of, I guess you could say alchemy, kind of the shift in matter, you know, walls turn into humans. Um, there's kind of this, you can see kind of astrology, alchemy, these explorations of, of magic um, within just a lot of like magical things within her paintings. I'm trying to think of one specific one that I can bring up. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many though, they're all like there's incredible. So many. A lot of like, there will, be a, there will be a figure sitting in a chair, but the chair becomes them. And, and they're morphing into the chair or the wall. Mm -hmm. You can see a figure coming out of the wall, right? Like, that's why I say alchemy is that matter is shifting, right? So she seemed very open to um, exploring that. And I find that theme very interesting just in terms of, um, you can think of our emotional world or psychic world um, alchemically as well, just in terms of, you know, we also have the power to shift our emotions or um, our perspective. Uh, and, you know, that would be the mental version of shifting, shifting from one state to another mm -hmm. and having that evolution. Yeah, I want to look more into her work because I, I did not know about her and wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, right? Mm -hmm. They're so, yeah, they're so detailed too. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Also, yeah. The, um, she was kind of interested in a lot of like Carl Jung, Young, I don't know how to mm. pronounce it, but um, and especially like also there's other um, psychologists and people who kind of um, try to adjust or disprove some of the ideas that um, um, Freud brought up because the thing is a lot of the time people think that Freud was kind of a catalyst not a catalyst, I guess, but um, someone who has created so much um, movement forward in psychology, when um, in reality, most psych like psychologists would say that, or psychiatrists would say that he was kind of the catalyst for people to try and disprove whatever the hell he actually came up with. So that's why there was a lot of like development around that time is because he kept on saying outlandish shit and implementing it on actual people and a lot of people had to kind of you know push back um through a lot of research so a lot of research that actually came from that time is because of him but not because he was so revolutionary in a good way as much as like he just said so much shit that people were like oh okay whoa 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 <laughs> let's let's take a moment right now because <laughs> this is insane um and i think that the one of the um people she was interested in was Op um, Uspensky, which is this um, this is this Russian um, esotericist. That's what they call them, you know. Um, mm. But basically, he was very interested in fourth dimensions. So I think that she probably was really interested in all of these ideas of different dimensions and stuff like that because they were just kind of coming in, I guess, and people were just. Um, getting into these ideas in general in terms of art and when you look at mm -hmm. her work like i just looked at some of her stuff she definitely looks like a more modern boss like Her hieronymus boss um just her works definitely have that kind of slight creepiness to them because of the difference in texture i feel like like with mm. with boss it was more about like him coming up with 
uh, monsters, but the textures were quite normal, I guess. You would you would expect those textures, but with her, like one of the images that comes up immediately, um, it's really interesting because the image itself shows something that looks kind of like an umbrella or maybe a um, an eggshell or something like that, but it's furry. Like something about mm. furry things, they just really love those furry <laughs> things, didn't they, huh? Um, but it does make you feel a little bit uneasy because you expect it to be a smooth oh. surface, right? So I think that's one of the reasons yeah. why their works read as such like surrealist kind of work is because it causes you to feel a little bit of that uneasiness from like um, the this uncanny valley that everything falls into where you know mm. kind of what object they were going for, but because the texture is different, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There is um so there's one image mm -hmm. that always comes up in Leonora Carrington's work, but also I think I've seen it in Remedio Sparrow's. What I can okay, I guess what I can do is describe the image sure. to you too. But I see a theme that comes up and there's one picture if you Google Remedi Remedio Sparrow, there's a photograph of her with kind of this shell like structure around her face and it's like this paper mache triangular um i don't know like head you know sculpture around her head oh i and see it's it because their face is on the side and then an opening for her face to show and this same form i see appear in a lot of paintings and it looks and i'm just i don't know what it is but I see that same kind of triangular head form in a lot of the figures, not a lot, but in some figures and it appears again and again. And that's one of my curiosities one day I hope to understand, mm. but I just don't really know what the, what the, the idea is. Changing faces, like mm -hmm. having different dimensions of your own face or, yeah, I'm going to try to find a painting where we see the same form. Mm. That's so cool. It's so strange. They're so odd. <laughs> <laughs> this is like no explanation. It's just, yeah. Yeah. You gotta go with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they used so many um, egg shape things. Yeah. Like starting with Boss and this, this um, two artists who were inspired by him, all of them mm -hmm. used this weird... Um, kind of like a eggshell shape or texture um yeah. it's not it's not always the side like not always the shape of the egg but it has like this um quality to it so where wherever there's like a hole it feels like it was a shell like the thinness of it all it's so odd these different shapes that come up and it's funny because that's i guess that's the whole oh. point of surrealism too like do you see what i mean actually you know what this mask that she's wearing um, yeah leonora made it okay so this is the thing romanio Svaro is wearing it but leonora is the one who paints it oh very often um. yeah you're right so, but anyways, just like such a weird, strange form. And it's, it's funny because if you listen to interviews of Leonora Carrington, I don't know if she's still alive today, but she lived very long. So, mm -hmm. which is nice because you, you know, we get to know her more that way. Yeah. And she, when she speaks to art historians, when she's interviewed about her art, you can see that she gets frustrated because people are trying to rationalize her work or in intellectual like you know speak about it in an intellectual way mm -hmm. she's always just like it's visual it's just what i put on the canvas like i don't need to put me <laughs> into it. it is what it is and i love that because it's it's like yeah that's the whole point of surrealism mm. i, I know it's gonna come to, up, to a but... point uh, because the thing is i think it kind of crosses into more abstract art when it's discussed yeah. this way because the thing is with surrealism it does have a difference between th there is a difference between surrealism and abstract art i think that oftentimes people use them interchangeably and that mm -hmm. wouldn't be really correct because abstract mm -hmm. art yeah. is abstract if it's something weird something psychedelic or something like that it's not necessarily abstract or i i would say i would argue that it isn't abstract at all yeah. um abstract work would be more um of like um, Malevich or 
um, actually he's more like you know suprematism whatever like he he came up with his own thing but Kandinsky had more of a like pure abstract kind of art where he focused on lines figures and color um, that wouldn't suggest a form to, to compare That's to exactly something else right. you know, like like surrealism right. oftentimes suggests a body or suggests a thing um, which yeah. is very different from abstract art yeah yeah, totally. That's the thing is surrealism rep re surrealism um, does represent form, just like you said, just forms that we're not used to seeing in the real world. So then it opens you up to this realm. And I think kind of coming back to that idea of Leonora, you know, getting frustrated in, in interviews of if we're trying to rationalize her work. But to, to me, at least, surrealism art is more about feeling the artwork than understanding it on a mental, you know, on a mental basis. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that a lot of the time, um, this subversion of textures is what they kind of focus on, maybe unconsciously, oh, yeah, I don't know true. if it was conscious. But oftentimes I think when I look at a um, surrealist painting, oftentimes if it's very detailed, it, it becomes really strange looking at it because I keep on seeing textures that I don't expect or textures that make mm -hmm. me uncomfortable like it's always mm -hmm. something furry yeah. where it's not supposed to be furry or something yeah. really eerily smooth where it's not supposed to be um, mm. and it evokes it evokes a feeling from you immediately it's, it's sen the like, same it's because it's sensory it's the same feeling as looking at an AI influencer or not AI influence, but like you oh. know the avatar influencers, where they're just like they're almost human, but something about their texture makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like the uncanny valley, you know? It's almost there, but because it's just like doesn't quite make it, you kind of fall into this valley of like, ew, something's wrong about this image, and I don't like know what it is, but it makes me feel gross. Pictures and stuff, yeah. You're just you just know it's not real yeah like uh, j just something slightly irks you that's yeah. why like do, do you know this like mm -hmm. um christmas express or whatever that that sh that movie i don't remember what it's actually named something yeah. express. Uh, that's the thing they yeah. went for too much of a realistic texture for 3d generated images that movie's so creepy it's so creepy it's <laughs> the, the red dog whatever the red dog the, the one that's like so they did oh. Oh, you know they did the red dog the the whatever his name is i don't yeah. remember but the the one that's like really big you know like that story about a big red dog they tried the to make it huh clifford yes, yes. Okay. So they try to make a live action of him and of course it looks terrifying oh. because it's a dog that's bloody red yeah <laughs> It I looks think, yeah. terrifying. Like everything they're trying to make, like nowadays, like the last version of Cats. Um, like there's so many new movies. Like even all the that Disney too. movies. Like this is what it just creates. Like a it's it's weird... pure surrealism. You know what? If they would if they would lean into it, it would be art. Mm -hmm. You know, like it wouldn't be like ew. Okay, you missed the mark. You know, because it's like yeah. you went for it on purpose. You basically made a spoon that's furry. You know, like it's. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's not for everybody, but it's for someone, for someone who's a freak like, who likes that kind of yeah. freaky shit, you know? <laughs> don't pretend this is not what you're going for. Exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> like, I feel like with a lot of people um, nowadays, I think that they don't understand that, like, um, maybe our technology will get to that point where mm -hmm. it doesn't feel strange. But right now, all of those, like, models, influencers, whatever that they create with this, like, visual art um like digital art they always creep me out a little bit like sometimes you see a picture and it's like it's just it's almost there yeah. but something about it is so fucked up <laughs> like i think that's why like you know the when they first started having 3d effects and stuff in movies like they weren't pretending and just you know making you think that it's reality or whatever like but they were taking it as like okay this is we're trying there Instead of nowadays, they're just trying to pretend this is reality, like just showing you how it could be in a real way, but we're not there yet still. You know, I think that in, in many ways, like animation, when they choose a stylized approach, they um, like very highly sty like stylistic kind of approach, not realistic approach. I think 3D works a lot better. Mm -hmm. That's why, for example, if you look at Bratz, right? Yes, it's very um, like, 
you can see that it's a 3D generated yeah. show and it was made in the early 2000s, so they move funny and whatever. But it's interesting that that movie that I told you about, the, that Christmas Express or whatever yeah. the hell, it's so creepy, <laughs> even though there was so much more money and so much more like um, animation kind of work that went into it. Because they're also mixing like... Because they were trying to make it realistic. Yeah. They yeah. were trying to make it realistic and they were not trying to make it look like it's a character. They were trying to make it look like it's, it's people, mm -hmm. right? If yeah. you try to make a character, it does not look as creepy as when you are trying to make a human and it's just not quite there. It's strange that we kind of catch really small things about images that kind of push us over the edge into the valley, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why when you will look at Boss's work, for example, it looks like, oh, this is just like kind of medieval-esque, um, mm -hmm. like, aesthetic. Then you look closer and you're like, oh, it's a lot more detailed than medieval aesthetics, you know, like than those paintings on the sides of the, those medieval texts or whatever, even though they, they were inspired by that. Um, and then you look even closer and you see something that's so freaky and you're like, <laughs> what is going on you know and i think that with yeah. this artist like when you look at their work it's kind of like boss except they actually experiment a lot more with the textures and that's what makes those paintings slightly uncomfortable to mm -hmm. look at mm -hmm. yeah it's funny i never thought of the textures but now that i look at it again um it's really prominent it really shows mm -hmm. so, so the last um i sent a, a photo the, the last one yeah yeah, and that's the last one I'll talk about for Remedios Faro, but a lot of people think that, because she died at 54 of a heart attack, oh, okay. and this was the last painting that she painted, and it's wow. one of the only paintings that doesn't have figures in it, and when you look at it, it's like, a lot of people say that she predicted her own death, mm -hmm. um, but this is a really interesting one that people talk a lot about for that reason. And it's kind of the idea of this still life, but moving and shifting. And then as, so basically it's a table and you can see a candle in the center. Um, there's a tablecloth that's twisting. So there's this, there's this swirling movement. And then above the table is, are these plates that are slowly, slowly rising as if being within this current and then even higher there are fruits so as if the fruits and everything are flying even higher and higher and they're twisting in this like swirl and then outside of the swirl like this gravitational force or something they start to explode and like expand yeah. and it, and again it's it's the only paint it's one of the only paintings without figures which is not very typical um for her and it was done you know the same year that she died so it's pretty interesting i like the way like the light reflects from the candles on the walls and stuff like mm. i know I right just love it so much the structure yeah. of the space is very mm. um cubist especially and the bottom mm -hmm. the floor and she has that structure in her spaces very often mm. yeah it seems like yeah. she was probably inspired by those paintings of like there was this painting called um the figure descending on the stairs. Mm. I think it was Picasso or maybe it was Breton or someone. Like someone, one of them painted something like that, um, which was like one of the earliest cubist works. But it wasn't like, it wasn't all the way cubist yet, but it was like getting there, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. I think that this kind of reminds me of the way that they constructed the space um, with this kind of fragmented approach. And um, mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting because um, there's flies on the painting, but the mm -hmm. flies are a lot bigger than they should be, and it yeah. seems like they're sitting on top of the painting. This looks mm -hmm. like the oh, image yeah. is happening, and the flies are completely different. Like they are kind of sitting on top of it, um, on top of a, another surface. It looks like they're just from a different dimension, basically. Like you're looking at an image of something happening, but you're also very aware of it having a surface mm -hmm. instead of That's it being, you know, like an immersive kind of experience. Right. That's what I think is so interesting about the way that she paints her spaces is that you feel like it's the construction of a dimension. Mm -hmm. It's like it's you see the tiles, you see the walls, but everything feels contained in this mm -hmm. strange little dimension. Yeah. It's also interesting that there's nine fruits that are not um, bursting, mm. like nine planets. 
on different. <laughs> Oh yeah, Rings, that's kind funny. Of, you know, on different like paths or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've never thought of them. <laughs> no, it just it just looks like rings, you know, in our solar system, it does. and that's why no, it's like I wanted to count it and it nine fruits, but the other ones are blowing up. I don't know which ones. Yeah, she's that's talking funny. about. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a really interesting image. I wish this image was like. Um, kind of as popular as that image of a guy with a apple over I his know, head. Right? The apple over their head. I don't get that one. Or even the one where they're raining men. I don't get it. I don't know if you two know much about it, but I just. I mean, yeah. I. You know what? I have a very. I mean, I always kind of turn every conversation about art into like shitting on artists. <laughs> I just have a hard time with us. Like, I know that I'm an artist. I know that I've done like I went to school for it and everything but just sometimes I fucking hate us so much like for example with uh, with Dali he moved to towards photography later on and um, his photography images are not as popular as his paintings but he did do a lot of photography and what he did was kind of like practical effects basically right like he wanted to do the same imagery so like really weird images uh, things flying around, things that you don't really like expect to be flying around. Um, one of them was this photograph. I'm gonna show it to you. Let me let me look it up. Um, Dali flying cats. <laughs> um, okay. He basically had um, kind of like a bit of a setup going on. For example, the chair was actually hung up. So you can't really see the way oh. that it was like propped up or whatever, right? But he decided to throw the cats around for each one of the shots that he took. And he obviously had to take so many of them, Damn. right? So he literally like he so objects can be hung up and like and they, they're just like sitting there, or whatever. But cats were hurled across the fucking room like they are just not alive just hell? for the images. Wow. Like that's how that's crazy brutal. he is. And like, yeah, that's crazy. Like, and, uh -huh. and crazy, not in a good way. Not like, oh my god, he's so crazy. No, 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 no. That's, it's like, no. girl, get your shit yeah. together, kind of crazy, you know? And I think, yeah. I, I don't know, just like, he just, a lot of them just piss me off. I'm always like, before I got into art and I just liked art from afar, I was always like, Dali has such interesting works. Yeah. Because I just love non-representational art, you know. Like I've always gravitated towards really like weird shit. So I was like, "Oh, he's my go he's my boy," you know. And then I got into it, and I started and actually studying them. And I started seeing their like photography, for example. A lot of like a lot of, a lot of their photography is also very violent towards women. It's always like disembodied bodies and freaky shit like oh, that. Even in this in this photo of the cats, you can see like the figure of the woman and all that's showing are her breasts and her head's cut mm -hmm. off yeah by the water but like you know there you go even just even that small element that was purposeful yeah, yeah. like it's always um i don't know and i just feel so bad for these cats you can see that they're like they're scared they're wet they're Aww. just it, it's like yeah. how many times did they do that to them too i like, don't know how many hell? but i know that it was like quite a bit quite a few times because it is um, it was a long time ago, and at that point, and like, how do you get you the picture to be so like so awful. crisp? Yeah, you have to have tons of lights in the room yeah. and everything, and um, he would have to take a picture a million times to make sure that when he develops the picture, at least one of them worked, right? No, it's so worth it. Yeah. it it is absolutely yeah, it's not worth it, and it's not like this image is so yeah. revolutionary now that we have no. Photoshop. We like look back at it and we're like, what the fuck was that for, right? Yeah. Um, and even then, you could still do, um, like, compository kind of work by using, yeah. um, you know, like in the dark room, like, for example, I've done that before. In the dark room, I developed pictures by covering up some parts of the image, yeah. just like calculating the spots where I had to cover up, like, mm -hmm. put, like, tape over it or something. And then when I would develop the images, this part, I could, I could kind of uh, expose it to a different... Um, slide or a different part of the um what is it called um or like the, the film so you use a different part of the film a different shot mm -hmm. right and then you expose it 
and you can have basically kind of like old school Photoshop mm -hmm. situation going on. He didn't have to do this. He could have just been a little bit more creative with it and used images of cats to yeah. expose them on this other piece of yeah, paper or so whatever. There was no need for this. Yeah. Even back so then. So that act of cats around, like, yeah. that's weird. And then he's like, his partner, they also had such a freaky relationship. They were so fucking weird. Of course. And he was like a masochist to the max. Like, he was obsessed yeah. with masochism. <laughs> and like, he yeah. thought that everyone else was also like secretly a masochist. And that was, and that's the pitfall of all surrealists to me, at least, is the fact that mm -hmm. they are so obsessed with the idea that everyone has the same psyche. That mm -hmm. deep, deep down, we all have the same desires right. which is really really strange to me because like i understand having this idea of like different levels of psyche you know like some some things are more subconscious than than conscious but believing that everyone has the same subconscious like desires is really really weird mm -hmm. to project it on top of everybody like be, being like you know what i kind of want to like cut a man or something like that you know and then just being like just believing that since everyone must too, want this everyone thing. else does too like it's a little bit insane to do that. Mm. Yeah. Like we we call a lot of people crazy because they have crazy urges, for example, right? But because they were artists and they were saying then it doesn't count. Yeah. And then it was like you know it's just deep yeah. deep down or whatever. Everyone's fine with it. That's what I exploring. I kind of yeah. I don't know, man. I always feel so annoyed by every time every time I get like in deep into like some kind of mm -hmm. movement and so start always discover reading. things you don't yeah yeah and this... like who knew that he was flinging cats around yeah. like who knew that <laughs> i don't know you know yeah there's never <laughs> not something we discover that's like not crazy yeah and like i understand that <laughs> art is crazy sometimes that's like mm -hmm. part of yeah. its appeal to be honest like some of it is just like the fact that artists do get crazy ideas yeah but there are limits, girl. Like, you gotta understand but that when you put something on somebody else. That's the thing. But there is often that masochistic side. Mm -hmm. And sadistic artists, side, then, right? Because... But then don't inflict it on others. Exactly. That's the thing. Like, I, like, if you're a masochist and you want to be, like, to take it to extremes or whatever the fuck, like, I don't care. Honestly, it's your life. Do whatever you want. But, like, just the idea of being like, you know what, um... I personally would love to be, to, I would love my balls to be, you know, <laughs> hammered <laughs> to the red square. That's like, uh, that's what we talked about last time is yeah. that there's a guy who like hammered his balls to the, to the red square with a like an nail. activist. Yeah. An activist or like, he, I don't, he, I think he's like an artist. I don't know if he's even an activist, but in any case, I don't care. Hammer mm -hmm. your balls or you want, hammer away. You do you know? you on you. Yeah. Yeah. It's on you. But when you yeah. but when you start saying everyone wants their balls to be hammered to the red square and you walk around with a hammer mm -hmm. hammering everyone's balls <laughs> to the red square, that's when we have a problem. Exactly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Artist is a pretty generous term for that. <laughs> yeah. For whoever that is. Honestly, so, you're right. We should stop calling them artists and start calling them like, I don't know, something else. Freaks. Yeah. <laughs> Freaks could also be used in a, in a, in a nice way, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I just don't, I can't think of a I word. I like the word freaks. Yeah, no, I don't know either. <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, we could call them like little Freuds or something like that. Like find something that they hated, right? Because <laughs> Freud hurt their ego so hard. We can call them like little yeah. Freuds. <laughs> now yeah, it's just showing back. it. Oh my goodness. <gasps> Yay, Lopa. Yeah. She's like, why is everyone screaming my name? She can't hear anything. <laughs> oh, she can't hear, well, she can't hear me. One of us. There you go. Mm -hmm. She's so adorable. Like, every time I edit um, the podcast after, um, if she was sitting on one of our laps, you can hear her, like, coming up to the mic and being like... <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Mm -hmm. Sick and twisted. Yeah. Anyway, what else did you guys I like? Did you, did you talk about any everything that you wanted to bring up or not? um for now yeah, yeah. we can now. definitely do another episode because there's we so much do to say someone so like many... specific artists too sometimes yeah. 
Yeah, totally. Because yeah, yeah. one of these artists, I don't remember which one, but one of the ones that you mentioned, I remember that Madonna used imagery in one of her music videos from them. No way. Yeah, I don't remember which one though. I want to know. It's definitely one of the two that you named. It's Madonna's bedtime story. Yes. Who? And who yeah, it's Leonora Leonora Carrington. Okay, yeah. And she uses just like this, yeah, these like kind of like this long dress and like big hair, kind of again the witchy vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's the thing. Like that's what I love the most for this podcast is talking about like pop culture mixed in yeah. with the with the art just because i personally find that there's like whenever people talk about art they either talk about things like banksy you know just the surface level like just scratching it mm -hmm. a little bit or they talk about art in such a heady way to the point where it's like if you don't have fucking five years of yeah. pre-existing knowledge about this specific art movement you are sitting there like trying to understand and most things you don't really get much from it yeah. or you get like a lecture on their life and that's it and you know you can't really focus yeah yeah and i love when it's like mixed yeah. when you find some kind of connection yeah. to pop oh, culture in the past okay. what she sent a link oh so you can really see how i like as soon as 2010 mm. i feel like that was really the resurgence of female mm -hmm. surrealist artist like, and Tilda so here this article shows some different examples tilda swinton does, does a like fo photo photograph shoot of taking different char different characters from leonora carrington and mm -hmm. um, see that's the shit that they should be fashion. inspired by for um yeah. fantasy movies honestly because this is perfect for that oh, type of shit honestly, right well, i actually talked about it yeah, in my last video uh, because Winx is going to have like a big, big live action adaptation as a film. And Winx has like a million different dimensions or not dimensions, but realms where people live. So like a very like cosmic kind of situation, mm -hmm. you know, like a space opera. You can pull so much shit out and like create this new images. Um, I, I don't know. It would be really cool. I feel like that's why I like... Um, when that happens in like Star Wars or something like that, because it's like you have this massive budget, but all you're spending it on is just action. And like the imagery around you is very stale. You basically remake Blade Runner over and over and over again. Like there's needs to be a fucking limit. And the costumes and fashion are pretty typical. Exactly. Very standard. Very standard. Yeah. You know, like that's why. Whereas modeling mm -hmm. after these women in the surrealist movement would be so interesting because what they're really doing is exploring exploring female roles mm -hmm. beyond just the sexual mm -hmm. you know either the pure or the sexual and it's right? actually like, more disturbing in, in terms of because it's actual like anguish rather than just pent-up violence yeah. against women yeah mm -hmm. A lot of body horror and stuff like that are in, in female works is what I like because they're exploring the fact that body horror is just like things that happen to us rather than things that you inflict on yeah. others. Mm -hmm. Talk like, yeah, like Sickness look at stuff. Frida Kahlo's work, for example, and she has a lot of she has a lot of that, like, the like you look at some of her paintings and it makes you uncomfortable yeah. because it's the it's like the open mm -hmm. you know you see her body it's very physical mm -hmm. but she had her whole she also had like i don't remember what it was but she was in an accident so she was in a cast yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a lot of her too so i'm sure that was a big part of her exploration too mm -hmm. yeah so yeah let's do was, another episode we that should do fun. another episode yeah <laughs> and talk more about this type of stuff Anyway, thank you so much for chatting with us and yeah. being so much like that was really interesting to talk about those two artists. Yeah, um, that's going to be my oh, new yeah, obsession for the week. I know we all <laughs> will be looking at it. Honestly, oh my god, you can listen to so much. I'll send you to a podcast episode of an expert on Remedios Varo. Okay. Uh -huh. But like, so the two artists I mentioned, they had a third friend. Caddy, and I think she was more photography, mm -hmm. Caddy Horn or something like that. And so it was like these three women just like doing crazy, doing these like crazy artistic things together. And they loved cats and they loved like. And they were witches. <laughs> and 
when they were witches. Like, it's so sweet. We you should know, become like witches. It, yeah. We should become witches. Let's do a coven. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> well, it this will be a trilingual coven. Because yeah. you guys can speak in French. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will teach you, you some know? Russian. Exactly. <laughs> Me and the Hope are going to talk in Russian. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That was great. Awesome. Oh, thank you too. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. 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 See you next time. See you. Yes.